Good morning, PTNI's Daily Show. Happy Monday morning to you here. Normally on Q&A Mondays, I'll be your host, Alan. I have the pleasure of serving as the COO of ICE and faculty member of Fitness Athlete Division. As I said, normally on Mondays, we talk about Q&A and, and take questions from you all as the listeners and answer them. But today is a little different, a little special day. Today is November 11th, which means that it is Veterans Day. So today we're going to talk about all things veterans on the podcast related especially to veterans health and how we can help our veterans uh, from a physical therapy point of view. Before we get started, just really briefly, uh, big thanks uh, to all the folks who came out to cervical spine management this weekend in Milwaukee. We had a blast up uh, up in actually Fox Point, a little bit north of Milwaukee. Uh, Jeff and I normally do that course every year with our friend Rachel. Been doing that every year for the past couple years um, at Marquette. But Marquette uh, double booked that weekend, and and we had to find a, a new spot. So big thanks to Integra Physical Therapy, Eric and his crew for jumping in and offering to host us and host the course, uh, and make sure that we could still do that course that we do every year on this weekend in Milwaukee. And then big thanks to uh, to Rally Physical Therapy for having us out in Chicago this past Friday and letting us get uh, 20.5 done um, while we were on the road on the way up to Milwaukee. So thanks to uh, to Kate and Kelly and, and Heather from Rally for making that happen. Don't forget, tomorrow is Tuesday, so we'll be doing our very last recap roundtable, speaking of uh, the CrossFit Open, and uh, recapping the 20.5 workout as well as recapping the Open as a whole and putting our little special physical therapy twist on it as we tend to do. So let's get started. Veterans Day. Um, what is the difference between Veterans Day and Memorial Day? I always like to start here when I when I talk about veterans health because I think um, we can get it confused. I think folks who aren't uh, veterans don't particularly care about the difference um, or understand the difference or, or why the difference is a big deal. But on Memorial Day, which is in May, uh, we remember veterans who didn't make it home. So veterans who died in combat or who have passed on versus Veterans Day used to also be kind of somber. It was created after World War One to kind of remember the effects that a large-scale war can have on on countries and, and the planet as a whole, um, but kind of uh, changed over the years to be more of a celebration of, of living veterans. So there's a lot of parades now, and a lot of places have um, free meals all day long and, and free things for veterans to, to, to celebrate their service. So that's the difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day and how they're kind of different. One is a little bit more somber and reflective, and one is a little bit more celebratory. So before I want to get into the weeds too much, I want to look at some of the data because I think it's really telling about what's going on with veterans' health. And we know suicide is a big issue. We know um, coping mechanisms is an issue, um, how, how veterans cope with issues, especially returning from combat. We know substance abuse uh, is a big issue among other other things, and mental health in general is, is a really big problem. So if we look at the population as a whole of, of the United States, 18.2 million people are veterans, which means about 20% or, or every fifth person you meet is going to be some sort of uh, veteran. That doesn't necessarily mean combat veteran, but they've done at least one uh, one contract, one one round with one of the different military branches, so they've probably served at least two or three years. We know that 50% of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans have served multiple deployments, and if we take a second and reflect on what year it is, it's 2019, and that the, the Afghanistan war started in 2001, that is an 18-year war, that's the, the longest war in American history, and so if, if we really try and grasp what that actually means, that means there are people who are serving an entire career in the military who have known nothing but, but deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, who have literally spent 20 years coming and going uh, from combat zones, which is uh, can be telling of, of why these folks um, um, struggle so hard with, with readjustment um, out of the military, um, with, with mental health, and also with physical issues, with, with injuries, with, with amputations and head injuries, and all the, the kind of unique injuries that, that plague the veteran population. 
When we look at, at mental health and veteran suicide, uh, we had 6,000 suicides per year from 2008 to 2017. And we saw a sharp increase um, in that time frame from about 16 a day to about 17 a day between that same time frame, 2005-ish to 2017. Veterans are 1.5 times more likely um, than non-veteran adults to commit for commit suicide when we adjust across all variables, age, sex, uh, socioeconomic status, all that sort of stuff. And that just is really not good. Um, I, I don't have to interpret that data too much for you to know that that's, that's not good data. So when we look at why, what's, what's going on, why is it such an issue, one of the biggest factors I think we have to admit, um, and, and nobody likes a scapegoat, nobody likes to blame anybody, but we really have limited resources. Uh, we still, in, in 2019, are not putting as, as much resources behind helping these folks transition as much as we could. We know the VA is is swamped. Um, obviously not the only reason that, that veterans are struggling, um, but it certainly doesn't help. Uh, 1,200 facilities across the country serving over 9 million patients. Um, and they're big facilities, they have a lot of providers, but when we look at their utilization data, it's staggering. Um, we complain a lot about volume and productivity in physical therapy, but, but what the VA as a whole has to deal with is nothing short of incredible. Um, that's an increase of 3.3 million patients in 2000 to where it is now 9 million in 2017. That's unbelievable. Um, 46 million outpatient visits and 500,000 inpatient visits in 2000 to almost 100 million outpatient visits and 700,000 inpatient uh, admits in 2015. Cost to treat those patients increasing from about 5700 to almost $10,000 a patient. So doubling in cost to, to treat folks, massive, massive increase in the volume of folks who are seeking care. Uh, that's a 272% increase in patients, a 204% increase in visits, and a 150% increase in cost per patient. So all that to say, they are absolutely crushed. Um, and if you are listening to this and you're a veteran or you have a family member or a friend who's a veteran or you, you know, a lot of you have had obviously patients who are veterans, you know the uh, uh, the frustration that is there with trying to actually get health care from the VA. Uh, I am somebody that pays. I I have uh, health care coverage for the rest of my life as a combat veteran, and I never use it. Uh, I pay cash for all of my health care. Um, there's an awesome VA facility 45 minutes south of here in Ann Arbor that's, that's world class, that partners with University of Michigan to have University of Michigan physicians on staff, um, and is just a great gorgeous facility that's absolutely swamped with with patients and if i called right now and, and try to get an appointment it would be six to twelve months from now so i'm somebody that even though i have uh, health care for the rest of my life through the va i never use it I, I pay cash whenever i happen to need to enter the healthcare system for little things like uh, dental checkups and eye exams. Um, and I know a, a, lot of, a lot of my friends who I served with are very, very similar, even though they have coverage. Um, getting there is a pain. Uh, getting an appointment is a pain. Just utilizing that healthcare is such a pain uh, in the butt that, that many of us don't use it. And so keep that in mind as well, that, that even though we have all this data on utilization, a lot of folks are just not being seen, they're not getting care because of, of how crushed the VA is. So there's a lot of folks going around undiagnosed with, with physical stuff, but also with, with mental issues because it is so hard to actually get in and be seen. Um, I think of my experience transitioning from the Army, um, coming back from my first deployment, which was to Iraq, and and having a couple months off and, and really just no follow-up from the military, no follow-up uh, from the VA when I was on leave. I got a, a telephone call that, that asked a, a couple questions. This was back in 2009, so we've come a long way, but it was pretty poor getting a telephone survey, asking a couple questions about how I was doing and, and being told, congratulations, you don't have PTSD. All the while, I was just drinking myself unconscious every day on leave and, and 
just basically lied to the lady on the phone about how much I was drinking and how I was feeling. Um, and after a 30 second phone call being told I didn't have PTSD and then coming off of, of leave and, and going back to duty, um, a little bit better transition um, coming back from Afghanistan with the VA providers on site at our transition site and getting veterans enrolled into the VA so that when they uh, discharged from uh, the military, they would be able to already be in the VA healthcare system and, and start seeing VA providers uh, right away, trying to reduce that transition time where veterans kind of fall through the cracks. But it still happens. Um, my story with post-military life um, is is getting out of the army and, and, and deciding a lot of stuff, deciding uh, to go back to school, deciding that I didn't need to exercise ever again. Um, obviously, a lot of you know my story with, with putting weight back on and then, and then peeling that weight back off over the past couple years. Um, and then going into the VA actually and, and being a, thinking I was going to be a control subject for a case study looking at functional MRI and, and post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans and actually being being pulled out of the study as a control subject and being put into the experimental group um, after the the study team it kindly informed me that that my PTSD was actually quite bad and I wasn't appropriate to be a control subject as somebody that didn't have PTSD and and myself thinking I was doing okay um, came out of the military and got back into college and hey I'm not homeless and I'm a college grad so those are measures of success right so that I must I must be very very successful and I, I'm certainly not uh, a veteran that needs any help and actually being told by the VA actually you you do need help being put in the experimental group being put on um, antidepressants sertraline um, is part of the study and then uh, having that continue after the study um, but fell through the cracks still. Um, finished grad school and started working and found CrossFit and, and have been amazed that it's been now two-ish, two-ish years, almost two years of not following up with my provider at the VA, not refilling my prescription, not a single phone call, uh, no no follow up from the VA to a person who was on antidepressants um, and getting them regularly and who just stopped showing up one day, stopped refilling the prescription um, on the website, no follow up as to what's going on with me. And, and I think that's quite common um, with the VA and between veterans is that they are, again, just so crushed, so swamped, they don't have the resources um, to, to follow up with people and, and people uh, veterans just kind of fall through the cracks, even if they're already getting care and, and um, getting help for, for physical and mental health issues, they still can fall through the cracks. I'm certainly one of them. Um, obviously, I'm doing doing well, but but there are a lot who are falling through the cracks and not doing well, and I think that's where we end up with the problem that we have with, with mental health issues and veteran suicide is that even if we spend the time and resources to transition people well and get them care, if, if they fall through the cracks, then that's, I think that's where they end up being part of the statistic, which is, which I think is where we can help a lot because we, we see these people in the physical therapy clinic. Um, I think we can go a long way to helping these folks get on the right track, whether or not they're actively receiving VA care, whether or not there's somebody who has fallen through the cracks um, or is still actively getting care. I think uh, we can do a lot to, to help these folks. And I think that starts with, with understanding kind of the the mindset uh, of a military veteran um, and understanding that that label means means a lot but it also means nothing and they're no different than any other patient as, as far as what they need to do uh, they need to get moving they need to eat better they need to not put poison in their body um, they need to manage their stress um, and so we're going to talk about that here a little bit before I let you go um, so the main thing I think that will help you as somebody who may not be a veteran or know a veteran to understand is is that most military folks are really mission oriented. That's kind of the whole thing. Um, some folks make fun of veterans because their life is kind of on rail in the military. They're they're like uh, on a train and they can't get off, and it's it's you know quote unquote easy because you're told where to be, what to wear, you're given food, and you don't have a lot of choices, and it's kind of uh, made fun of a little bit and looked down upon as a simple life, a, a life for somebody who maybe 
is not intelligent enough or, or or not creative enough to make it any other way, um, which could not be further from the truth, but understanding that that there is that mission-oriented lifestyle, um, that military life is about one mission after the other, finish one, get another, finish one, get another, here's your next mission, complete it, come back, get another one, um, and that's kind of how life goes every single day, especially on, on a combat deployment. There are very little creature comforts very little variables on deployment it's it's very very regimented um there is is not a lot of downtime and so you kind of get conditioned to this lifestyle of of getting a mission finishing a mission getting a mission finishing a mission and then when you co come away from the military when you transition out of the military when you get discharged or retire um there is no more mission that that transition becomes what do I do? Uh, what am I supposed to do now? I'm, I've for for five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years. I've just shown up every day and been given what seems like an impossible task to do, or a whole list of tasks to do. And somehow we we got it done and made it back. And then that's just life on repeat. We would often joke on deployment that it was like the worst. Groundhog's Day ever, and if you don't know that movie reference, shame on you, but the worst case of Groundhog's Day ever is you literally are wearing the same clothes, sometimes literally the same clothes for weeks or months on end, and you're just kind of doing the same thing again and again and again, and then all of a sudden that's done, and you have all of these choices. Um, there's a really, really, really good movie, um, actually it's a, <laughs> a really terrible movie, called uh, The Hurt Locker. Yeah, that's the name of it. The Hurt Locker uh, about um, an explosives uh, ordnance team in, in in Iraq, and it's absolutely terrible. Uh, I would not recommend that you watch it except for the very last scene of the movie, um, where this guy, this this sergeant in the army who's been on multiple deployments, is is home on a break. Um, he's just finished a deployment. He's had multiple deployments. And he's walking through the grocery store and he's got a little post-it note from his wife that says get cereal and he's walking down the cereal aisle and he's just looking at all these choices and you can kind of see in his head clicking that he's thinking i i don't know what to do i'm not used to having all of this choice and freedom and it's overwhelming and uncomfortable and a little bit almost like worthless like what what is the point of having 500 different flavors of cereal Obviously, one is the most optimal flavor, and we should just have that one, and why am I spending my time in the grocery store trying to pick out cereal? And then the, the movie cuts right to the very end where he uh, goes back on duty and volunteers for another deployment to get to get away from civilian life and, and get back into a combat zone. And I think that's a very, very, very common um, feeling that, that veterans have, that... Um, uh, too much choice uh, when when we get discharged, almost overwhelming. Used to used to not having a lot of freedom, not having a lot of creature comforts, and then having all that just come back to you um, when you leave the military and you're suddenly a civilian again. Um, and you kind of have this idea as well, this mindset that this is all kind of uh, not worthless, but but too almost too luxurious. The the idea that that you've seen so much. Um, that that waking up and and going to the factory and and punching punching a time clock and spending your time picking out cereal kind of leaves you with this feeling not necessarily naturally um, suicidal or that that you don't want to be alive anymore but just you you get the idea that you've seen seen it all um, and and that nothing can be surprising um, or in exciting for you anymore and it kind of takes the takes the gusto out of life. Um, certainly I felt that way when I left the army back in, in 2012. Um, not that I felt suicidal or, or um, like I was going to harm myself, but just this idea that I've seen a lot and this is kind of boring now. There's, there's not a lot uh, left, not again, back to that, that mindset of not having a mission. Um, and I think with veterans, that's one of the things we, we need to hammer home with them is, Hey, you're done. Maybe you're, um, a disabled veteran now and you're, you are getting your income from the VA, from the government itself. Maybe you're a retired veteran and you have a pension. Uh, maybe you're a veteran who, uh, got discharged and, and used your GI bill, um, like I did to, to pay for your school. 
um, or you're thinking about it, so many veterans don't use the GI Bill benefits. For those who don't know, um, the GI Bill was was reworked a couple years ago, uh, pays for five years, I believe 36 months of, of school, and that includes housing allowance now and a book stipend. So a lot of veterans can have their bachelor's degree and even a little bit of a, a postgraduate degree completely paid for, and, and something like only 19% of veterans utilize that benefit. Billions and billions of dollars go unused with that benefit every year. Um, so if you have that veteran who is maybe thinking about going back to school or already has a lot of on-the-job training after retiring or or being uh, medically discharged, sit down with that person and ask them, what What do you wanna do? Like if you're feeling like you have no mission and you have no purpose, what do you wanna do? What would you like to do? Uh, we're so used to in the military um, being told what to do all the time and not having any choice. We kind of forget that that part of life, part of the fun of life of, of being a human being is is having fun and, and making choices about not what do I need to do every day, but maybe what do I want to do? So asking these people, what do you wanna do? What would you like to do? If I could take away your pain um, if I could take away all your problems, all your financial barriers, what would you like to do? Um, and, and get them on a path, get them to uh, get them, help them get set up with their, their benefits at the VA, with the GI Bill, get them back in school, have them utilize their schooling if they have it or their training and, and find something that, that they want to do and get them back on that mission, help them find that, that purpose. That's certainly been the biggest change um, in, in my life and helped me through my PTSD and depression of, of a point in my life where I would literally just wake up and, and drink or, or um, pop my pills from the VA um, and, and spend the entire day just trying to numb out the the day basically trying to time travel uh 24 hours in the future again and again and again um in, instead of having a purpose having a reason to wake up in the morning and get out of bed like so many of us have the other thing is is to get these folks moving uh, like i said the veterans are are no different uh physically in in most aspects than other humans they need to uh they need to get strong be strong they need to get their heart rate up a couple times a week um Again, in the military, you don't have a lot of choice over you, over your exercise. Uh, so I definitely burned out on exercise in the army, um, running running at a moderate pace for for three to five miles a day, and, and calisthenics, push ups and sit ups and and jumping jacks and burpees was pretty much it. And so that gets really boring. Um, it's a very much a routine that makes people hate exercise because we do it every single day, five to seven days a week. Um, with with no break and it's it's literally sometimes the same thing every day and that can really burn people out and, and make them hate exercise so so get them moving again a lot of folks uh, get out of the military and, and think they never have to exercise again um, it was something they got paid to do and it's not something they need to do and we know that could not be further from the truth so get them plugged in um, to to an exercise program get them plugged into an exercise program that has um, a social aspect to it like they're used to from the military and some accountability like they're used to from the military. You don't uh, you don't call in sick to physical training in the military. You don't not show up. Um, you don't skip uh, leg day in the military. You're you're there or you are in a lot of trouble. Um, so get them plugged into a community like that. Obviously, I'm biased. I'm gonna say CrossFit. You you knew it was coming. I'm wearing a CrossFit shirt. Of course, you knew it was coming. Um, I we have a lot of veterans at CrossFit Fenton. Um, veterans. Um, are, are all over CrossFit gyms. I think CrossFit and, and programs like it can be very, very, very powerful for helping um, a veteran transition and, and come back from, from some dark places. Certainly, I will credit CrossFit um, it is one of the defining factors over the past couple years that has helped me with my own um, PTSD and, and mental health um, transition from, from military life, from, from where I was a couple years ago to where I am now. Um, the other thing is like we have to talk to these people about lifestyle change, maybe more so than most of our patients. Um, like, listen, stop, stop putting all that bullshit into your body that you're putting into your body. Military members are used to drinking a lot, smoking a lot, chewing tobacco. Sometimes all that together. Sometimes having a, a dip of tobacco in your lips, smoking a cigarette at the same time while you're drinking. Um, that's I've seen that happen. I've I've been that person, so I know it can happen. Um, and and 
that kind of lifestyle of of I might die tomorrow, so so who who gives a shit um, what I put into my body is is fine when you're in Afghanistan, but now that you're you're done with the military, um, you have a lot uh, to live for, and but you're not going to make it if you don't change that stuff. So um, can we talk about cutting? Um, down on smoking, on chewing tobacco, a lot now, especially with with more and more states legalizing marijuana um, federally um, for for treatment for veterans. It's been legal for a while, but now with more and more states uh, de- decriminalizing it and legalizing it, we're seeing a lot of folks um, instead of drunk all the time to to cope, we're seeing them high all the time. So trying to to reduce um, all of that consumption of of just um, poison into the body, basically. Um, can we reduce some of that? Can we talk about smoking cessation, tobacco cessation in general? Can we talk about cutting out alcohol? Um, my personal opinion, and, and, and maybe some of you uh, disagree with this, is is if you are dealing with mental health issues as a veteran and you're having trouble with, with depression, one of the worst things you can be doing is is drinking. It's it's a it's a chemical depressant. You already have depression problems. It's, it's really, really, really bad. Uh, certainly Uh, I've been in a lot of dark places in my life over the past um, however many years, um, 11 years since uh, since joining the the military and discharging from the military Um, and and stopping drinking I I credit with with one of the biggest turnarounds not from only a a physical health standpoint over the past uh, two years or so of starting CrossFit but but mental health in general Um, so you know if if you want to find a way through this uh, then, then we need to talk about cutting out alcohol, cutting out bad food and eating fast food multiple times a day and cigarettes and marijuana and chewing tobacco and, and eight monsters a day, eight full calorie monsters a day. Um, can we cut a lot of that out? Because that will probably make you feel a lot better. We know it will make you feel a lot better physically, but it's also going to make you feel a lot better mentally. And then help these folks find a coping mechanism. Um, it's normal and natural to have coping mechanisms when you're stressful. Anybody who says they don't is a total liar and is, is probably doing something in secret um, that they would never talk about on social media to cope with their own stress. Uh, so we can't cope uh, with booze. We can't cope with drugs and pills. Uh, we can't cope with, with food. Um, a lot of f- folks have given me pushback for for saying you know hey exercise is my coping mechanism when i'm stressed i work out and feel better and and people have given me flack on social media and saying you shouldn't you shouldn't uh, cope with exercise you'll become addicted to exercise and to that i say go to hell right i'd i'd rather have somebody addicted to exercise and and feel the need to exercise when they get really 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 stressed instead of turning to turning to alcohol turning to drugs turning to pills turning to food um yeah, it would be great if somebody got stressed and their coping mechanism was to paint a picture and and that would be, you know, magical and 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 fun and and fairy tale and uh, optimal um but but a lot of folks um are going to cope with exercise, they're going to cope with with throwing themselves into work and and I I would rather see them do that than than cope with these other mechanisms. So help them find that outlet. Uh, maybe it is an exercise, maybe it is painting, maybe it is sculpture. Uh who cares? right as long as it's not those other things as long as it's something moderately productive um, then I think that's where we need to direct these folks energy another point is to, to have these folks have fun we talked about this already with finding something to exercise but but have fun in your life it's okay to have fun a lot of veterans need permission to have fun and not always be working. Certainly, in that statement I've just given, I've I've become a massive hypocrite because I'm somebody who who loves loves to work. Um, veterans have a lot of pride in doing stuff that sucks, and they've developed this this habituation to doing really grindy, unfun things, and almost taking pride in how much grindy, unfun things they can do. Um, but but let them know like. You, you don't have to live your life that way anymore. If you feel like you need to live your life that way, that's certainly not true. Um, you can do things that you want to do or like to do, um, even even if they don't suck and they aren't hard, um, and to stop doing things and interacting with things and people that, that don't make you happy. Um, in the military, you are not in charge of, of who's on your team and, and who you have to interact with, and so you develop 
a really good ability to to work with with people from all sorts of different backgrounds and ethnicities and, and demographics and and personality types and you you become really good at 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 working with a whole bunch of different people even if those people uh, piss you off all the time so so let them know you know you don't have to work a job that that makes you hate uh, going there every day. You don't have to hang out with friends that you think about um, how terrible it would be to hang out with them. You don't have to do that stuff anymore. You're you're off duty. You can you can have some fun. Um, find a job uh, that is rewarding that you like to go to. Find a group of friends and and other things to do that that you actually like to do. You don't need to just do stuff that sucks all the time because you're really good at dealing with with how bad that it sucks. Have some fun sometimes. My last point I want to make um, is is just have a, a humble honesty um, that if you aren't a veteran, you don't have veterans in your your immediate family. Um, you don't know anyone that's a veteran. Just understand that that you will not be able to 100% relate to these people. You always have trouble connecting with them. Um, the same way that I would have trouble relating to. Uh, an African American guy from the inner city, right? I don't know that person's experience. I haven't experienced that experience. I'm gonna have trouble relating to that dude. Um, I'm gonna have trouble relating to to a pregnant and postpartum uh, woman. Certainly, I, I've ramped up my education and, and treatment game with with those gals over the past year. Um, but just recognize that that a veteran will always feel more comfortable working with another veteran. The same way a, a pregnant lady is gonna feel more comfortable working with a female provider. Um, we, we like to to work with and relate to people who who are like us and we need to recognize that's a natural part of, of being a human being. So just understand that that maybe we won't be able to get these folks to 100% open up to us or 100% buy in with what we're saying because we can't relate to them. But that doesn't mean we can't help them. That doesn't mean because they won't buy in 100% that it's, it's not worth trying to help these folks and just treat their shoulder pain and move on. Um, we can still chunk away and, and give these veterans a lot of help the same way you can still help help that, that pregnant or postpartum gal. Um, yeah, she may not fully trust you as she would a, a female provider if you're a male provider, but, but she will still do the homework you give her and she'll still probably listen to you when you talk. Um, and even if it's not 100% buy-in, it might be 90% and that's better than zero. So, so don't give up on these folks um, because they're a little bit standoffish or, or they think you're a young punk millennial or anything like that that we're used to hearing in the clinic. Uh, um, give these folks a chance and, and chip away at them. Don't, uh, they, again, they're, they're kind of used to, to doing stuff that sucks and kind of being crapped on, um, and they're used to to uh, being uh, roughed around. So, so don't feel free to give it, uh, or, or sorry, feel free to, to give it back to them as much as they give it to you, and don't give up on them. And I want to leave you uh, as we wrap up here, as we've talked about the limited resources that the VA has to help these folks, kind of the origin of, of why I think the transition is so hard for military life, how to get these folks moving and, and increase their healthy lifestyle behaviors and find a coping mechanism. Um, when you stop listening to this today, when you when you turn off this, this podcast or turn off Facebook, um, I want you to do one thing, which is get a lot better at at assessing and reassessing these folks the same way you would any other patient. When a patient comes in or comes back in to see you, you don't just ask, hey, how's everything going? And let them get away with saying, good, I guess, and then you do the same stuff you've done last time. Really, really, really put their feet to the fire and ask, how are you doing? Don't ask, how are things going? You you wouldn't ask that to, to a postpartum mom. Hey, how's everything going with the baby? Good, great, uh, jump on the arm bike, right? You wouldn't do that. You would ask about symptoms, you would ask about um, pain, you would ask about pelvic floor stuff, you would reassess objective stuff. Do that with these folks too. Don't don't let them get away with, with giving you, I'm fine type of answer. Um, um, ask how are you doing um, if you if this is your initial assessment with them and they're coming in to see you for musculoskeletal stuff for PT ask about their transition 
get really detailed. How are things going? How do you how do you think things are going? Um, are you adjusting well? Um, have you found a job? Are you thinking about going back to school? Really, really, really get dialed in. Get those asterisk signs for mental health the same way you would get them for physical stuff. Um, don't don't let them get away with with saying I'm fine and they just come see you for some shoulder pain or something and you help them with their shoulder pain and you never see them again. Um, Take some responsibility and, and, and be a doctor and actually address all the facets of their life um, and, and put them to, uh, to the frying pan and ask them how their transition is going. Are they struggling? Um, are they thinking about hurting themselves? Have they thought about it in the past? Are they receiving treatment from the VA? Are they enrolled in the VA? Do they know about their GI Bill benefits? Spend spend five minutes in that initial evaluation addressing kind of the veteran-specific issues um, that, that we know they have going on more so than you would with, with another patient. Ask them, what are you having trouble with? Not, not physical therapy related. What are you having trouble with in your life, in your transition? Can I help? And I think if you have a good relationship with, with a mental health provider in town or, or a contact at the VA um, to, to get them enrolled in the VA, to get them to get them help and care, uh, that will go a long way um, to help them buy in with you as a physical therapist and come back and see you for physical therapy um, in, in addition to, to getting help with, with non-physical therapy related things. I think that will go very, very far. Um, so that was long, um, but I think needed, um, especially only doing it once a year. Um, I'll leave you with this. I, I would implore you um, to reach out to, to a veteran that you may know, a friend or family member, uh, maybe somebody that you went to high school with or, or you knew from undergrad, and, and ask them that same question. Hey, how are you doing? Um, don't just float something out there on Instagram. Um, we all hate that as veterans when we get these messages on Veterans Day. Hey, thanks for your service. Hope you're well. That's a really shitty, non-engaging thing. Um, ask, you know, hey, how are you doing? How are things going? Um, and and reach out to them in a sincere way. Um, if you can do that with one person today, I think you can make a, a massive difference. Um, I know myself personally. Uh, personally, I've had and known people, more people who have who have taken their own life um, after military service than have died in combat, which which is statistically um, accurate for for all, um, knowing that we've had almost uh, 7,500 uh, veteran suicides of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans um, since since 2001, and, and that we've only I, I say only um, um, not lightly. But comparatively, 4,400 died in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's, it's statistically likely to, to have somebody that's an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran take their own life than die in combat. And so for me, one, one of my uh, biggest regrets and something I think about very often on, on days like today is, is not reaching out more often to, to the guys that I served with and asking them that same question and checking in on them and, and knowing that I've went to more funerals for, for people that I've served with who have taken their own life than I have who have died in combat. And I think that's very, very, very powerful if you can reach out to, to one person today. Don't don't reach out to me. Um, reach out to, to a friend or family member that you may know, even if you don't know them very well, um, and just ask them, you know, how are you doing? Um, is there anything I can help with? Um, you know, if, if they don't know what's been going on in your life um, since they've been in the military um, or gotten out of the military, let them know like you're a physical therapist um, and, and you um, can, can help them um, with whatever is going on and that you know a lot of good resources um, to help them uh, with what may be going on. And maybe they are doing well. Um, and and uh, maybe you know that they're doing well. And that's okay too. And, and if you know that, then just feel free to send them a little message and, and thank them for their service, which they'll hate as we all do. We all hate hearing that. Um, but nonetheless, you're all going to say it. So we'll just kind of accept it. Because again, we have a lot of, of pride and, and, and ability and habituation to, uh, to doing stuff um, and accepting stuff that, that that sucks and that we hate, as I mentioned before. Um, so that's what I've got for you. Hope you all have a, a great Monday. Um, we'll see you uh, next time on the podcast here. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. 
If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.